Net Wealth Investments Limited is licensed to provide general advice. Our podcasts are not tailored to any one financial situation and may contain views of our presenters which may not align with net wealths. The guests, organization, and net wealth have an arrangement for their financial products to be available for investment through the net wealth platforms, and net wealth may receive fees from the guest. More information about net wealth can be found on our website, including our financial services guide and disclosure documents. Please seek professional advice before acting. Founders in the business still have client responsibilities. That is hard. If you don't, you lose touch too too quickly. And it's a great feedback loop to your broader strategy and what you're doing in the business. Hi, I'm Matt Heiner, Joint Managing Director of NetWealth, and welcome to Between Meetings. In this podcast series, I chat to industry professionals and thought leaders on what made their career successful and the opportunities and challenges they see on a wide range of topics as they relate to the delivery advice and financial services. I hope you enjoy their unique insights. David, welcome to the show. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for the invitation. Looking forward to it. It occurred to me a couple of weeks ago that this is a conversation that we probably should have had a long time ago. Well, we have had a lot to do with each other over the years. And I guess mainly in a professional sense, you, you don't get to have these sort of conversations um, in that forum, do you? No, not at all. But uh, really looking forward to it. I think there's a huge amount that we're going to cover today. But before we start, it's always good to just go back in time. For those of you that maybe don't know you as well as, uh, as I do, how did it all start? Yeah, it's a good question. I sort of finished my degree in the very early 90s, which a number of listeners would know, perhaps not everyone, that was the last sort of recession we had in Australia. So very difficult for graduates to get a get a role at that time. So yeah, struggled to get positions. I, uh, I actually kept the letters that I wrote, uh, application letters for a lot of jobs for many years after that. And going back on those, I thought, geez, I had no chance in hell of getting those roles. So a lot of those roles, I wish I'd kept it, but uh, I eventually threw it out. But yeah, look, I... Uh, I started off actually with AMI car insurance and honestly, I hated that job. I'd done an economics and commercial law degree at uni and so I started to look for other areas to, to study. And I came across at that time the graduate diploma of applied finance and investment, which was at now Fincia. That really got me interested in the industry. And it was really that that I lucked upon an opportunity with a business that was owned by uh, Mercantile Mutual, which is kind of now ING. That was a, a, an advice and research firm called Advisor Investment Services. So I was lucky enough to get a kind of junior analyst position in research there. And for my sins, I've been in and around research businesses and uh, investment analysis ever since. So, you know, 30 odd years. That was the, I guess, the original licensee or dealer group based out in Tassie from memory. That's a great memory. Yes, it was. So grew out of the Tassie business. It was an Australia wide network at the time. And it was very um, kind of formative in terms of my position as an analyst, which I've always remembered. And I think we get into understanding what advisors need. So working in a, in a dealer group at that time in research, you were having to answer advisor questions on various funds and so forth. So still today, what I say to a, you know, a lot of our investment analysts in the business is if you've done a manager review or gone along to a manager information session and an advisor rings you, asks you a question about that manager, and you can't answer that question, then you haven't done your job as an analyst. So I got caught out on that pretty early and um, swore to myself that I, I, I wouldn't let that happen again. So you mentioned you've been in and around research since then, probably a bit of an understatement. Obviously now running uh, one of the largest research houses in the country, if not the largest. How did that actually happen? You started in a small external research firm, so outside of a license, I think, was it called Assetware? It was, yeah. So I worked, as I said, initially at Advisor Investment Services. I then went to uh, to Lonsdale, which, you know, as many, many of you would know, is now two groups, Lonsec and Lonsdale. But at that time, the research was embedded in the, the dealer group of, of Lonsdale. And, and owned by Zurich at that stage? Not at that stage, but um, shortly thereafter it was, yes. And, and, you know, that was my first opportunity really to have or buy equity in a business and in a business that I worked. So I worked for a guy called Otto Pachula at that stage and uh, Otto and a number of associates of him set up the assetware business, as you say, and was a fourth shareholder in that business. So that was a great time, to be honest. Like, we were all very passionate about what we did, but you know, the early days of that business was a, a group of a group of guys of similar age that you know worked hard, but um, we had a bit of fun on the side as well. So yeah, that was that was a, a great time for you know for that period of my life. 
And the sophistication of the industry back then must have been completely different to what we experience now. Very different, Matt. Yeah, as you well know. I mean, I think uh, uh, going back then and through the sort of 80s into the early 90s was, you know, it was essentially almost life insurance agents becoming financial advisors. And so many of those came out of the big insurance businesses at the time being sort of AMP, National Mutual, as I said, Mercantile Mutual, Colonial Mutual, Prudential, you know, a lot of these businesses don't exist, at least by name anymore. So as you say, it shows how long I've been in the industry. When you think about some of the names that you've just thrown around, it is pretty remarkable that many of them don't exist anymore. Are there any sort of stories or, or things you can think about from that time that were sort of telling of, of where we've ended up? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, like I could tell a lot of stories actually about, you know, reviewing fund managers over over the journey and you meet some, you know, really interesting characters, some who are, you know, excellent investors, but really pretty eccentric uh, types of people. So I think, Probably one that springs to mind was, you know, again, many of the listeners would remember Greg Perry as being the sort of guru investor at uh, Colonial First State who did a terrific job. And I remember in those days we used to go in and depending on the manager actually spend up to, you know, two, two to three days reviewing every asset class of that manager. We don't do that anymore. It's more by asset class by asset class. So we were in at Colonial First Day and, and had done the review of their small cap strategy, which was managed by Barry Oh, sorry. Uh, Barry Henderson came after Greg, and we asked Barry, you know, do you do you manage the fund to a particular tracking error, or is that an outcome of your process? And he sort of said, "Did you, you know, did you ask Greg that?" And we said, "Well, yeah, we did." And he started laughing, and he sort of said, "Look, Greg wouldn't know what a tracking error is." Well, that probably shows the purity of his investment style, but you know, it'd be, um, I think, again. Although managers don't necessarily manage themselves to tracking areas, they certainly know what they are these days. Absolutely. And having worked through that environment, how did Zenith, what was the impetus for Zenith? Why did you start it? It's interesting you should say that because a lot of people sort of say, how's the business changed in the, this year will be our 20th year, Matt. So I was Congratulations. that by our marketing manager the other day saying, oh, what do you want to do for the 20th celebration? So it's nice that other people remembered in the business because I'd actually forgotten myself. But Look forward to the invite. Yeah, uh, you'll get it. I, I think, you know, at that time that, you know, sort of David Smythe and myself set up the business, there was a move to model portfolios at the time. And there was a move to uh, more constrained approved product lists. And a lot of that sort of came out of, if you think about the timing, you know, 20 years ago was just post the tech media telecom boom, and that blew up a lot of portfolios. It actually blew up a lot of advisors' businesses because too exposed to those metrics, which, you know, shot the lights out for a period of time, but then came crashing down really hard. So, you know, I think a lot of groups and certainly insurers required better governance, better compliance. And so we'd sort of seen that trend and started the business on the basis of that, which, you know, as I say, 20 years later remains, you know, really at the core still of what we do. And at the time, clearly you had a blank canvas as far as what it was that you wanted to build. How did you land on the business model at the time? Yeah, again, a question I get asked a lot. And I'll be honest, like the, the business model largely fell out of what we didn't want to do anymore. And what I mean by that is, you know, we'd been research analysts for you know, probably a decade at that stage. And we'd come from, I guess, organizations that tried to review and rate the whole market and all products. I think when you try and do that, well, one, not all products are good. And two, you just spread yourself too, too thinly. So, you know, there was a big issue, I think, in the, in the industry at that stage that uh, advisors really, really didn't value research. And they didn't value research because it was pretty shallow because we've spread too thin. So part of our kind of philosophy was, well, we really only want to focus on those managers and funds that ultimately are good and that advisors will use and investors and will invest in. And so again, that remains core of what we do, but of course that universe has grown a lot over time, both through um, you know the evolution of new pl- platforms and people using new platforms and different investment menus and you know the continued growth in the number of both boutique and global managers that have, you know, come into the Australian market. And when you look at the universe of funds that you research these days, sometimes it's the things that you say no to that can be as beneficial as those that you say yes to. How much pressure over time have you had to look at direct equities as an example, overseas funds, really expand the type of research that you're doing and and how and why have you resisted it? 
Yeah, so you do, of course. You get a lot of pressure from managers themselves to look at products that not always do we think they're good or worthy of being researched. As I said before, really just trying to focus on best products, the best managers, rate them accordingly and have them in client portfolios. Direct equities, we kind of felt, of course, there's a demand for direct equities by advisors. You know, I think a lot about being successful in business is knowing, or the old sort of uh, Clint Eastwood, um, Dirty Harry quote of knowing a man needs to know their limitations. So, you know, we didn't have an expertise in that space. A lot of the brokers are very good at research. I'd argue maybe not that great at portfolio construction. So it's, yeah, it, it's just not a space we felt we had a competitive edge or advantage in. So if that's the case, don't do it. And what's the culture that you tried to build within the business? You know, I think, uh, you know, I'd actually be interested in your comments on this. As you said, we haven't had these sort of conversations necessarily, even though we've dealt with each other a lot over the years. But, you know, coming from very small and humble beginnings, you, you, you really do build, a, I think, a collegiate team-based culture that's pretty flat. Mm. And of course, as, as time goes on and the business has grown and we've got sort of 100 odd people now, that's quite different, but we, we've been very focused on the people that we hire. Look, I'll, I'll be honest, you know, along the journey when we were not at the start, but probably, you know, the midway through that sort of 20 year time frame, we had a couple of hires that, you know, kind of upset the balance. And so we really started to be a lot more diligent on the people that we hired. You know, I think it's pretty standard these days, but, you know, started with kind of psychometric testing as, a, as an additional tool and meeting more people in the business, which is, you know, still things that we do today from a recruitment perspective, I think. So that's really important for culture. You don't want groupthink, but you do want people that are going to, you know, work as a team and work together. Not everybody especially in a business of a hundred odd people is going to, well, even know each other well. And certainly not everyone's going to love each other, but you do need to work together. So that's something we've really been very, you know, very focused on. And fortunately, touch wood, we've had uh, low levels of turnover, good staff engagement. And I think part of that is just, you know, trying to be transparent and honest with people and bring people along for the journey. So, you know, uh, shared vision and communicate that, you know, kind of regularly. It is hard building a business and you've clearly built a, a very successful and very big one. What, what are some of the other learnings that you, you think are worth sharing? You know, a lot of people say, and, and I'm sure they say to you too, Matt, gee, you know, I kind of admire your entrepreneurial spirit. And I kind of look at myself and think, no, I, I don't feel as if I have that entrepreneurial spirit. It's not I, at the end of the day. And maybe it comes from being an analyst of, you know, ultimately pretty conservative. So I, I think... One of the things is, you know, I've been blessed with a good memory. That's been important from the perspective of learning what to do from observing other people and other businesses, but equally learning what not to do. Mm. Uh, and I think some people miss that. Like, you know, I've had other colleagues and so forth say, you know, I hated that manager or I hated that CEO. I didn't learn anything. And I just I, I kind of push back on that and sort of say, well, no, you know, we learn a lot about what not to do. And that's still really valuable learning. And so I guess I've sort of kind of remembered those things. Yeah, I think for me, you know, probably a personal motto has just been persistence. You know, if I look at kind of the things that have worked out best for me, both uh, business-wise and even in personal life, it's, it's kind of persisting at things. Mm. It, it's pretty trendy these days, isn't it, to talk about sort of, you know, having agile business structure and, you know, pivoting based on customer feedback. And, and I think, don't get me wrong, I think there's a lot in that, but you need a core vision of what you're trying to achieve. And I, I think too many people kind of waver from that if it doesn't work straight away. Mm. An observation, possibly from afar, is that you, you have always been very hands-on and certainly you've come from being on the tools to now managing those on the tools. What, what have you found hardest about letting go or, or delegating responsibility? Yeah, that's a, that's, <laughs> that's a double-edged sword, isn't it? And, and I know you're the same because I know, you know, in uh, various pitches, you're still often a go, go along and speak to groups. And I think your reason for doing that is the same, I think, as, as why I do it. You know, both myself and Ben Davis, who are kind of the remaining two partners or, you know, I guess founders in the business still have client responsibilities. And I, uh, that is hard. And when you've got all the other responsibilities, I'm not going to deny that. But I think it's, if you don't, you lose touch too, too quickly. 
and it's a great feedback loop to your broader strategy and direction of you know kind of what what you're doing in the business so um as you say to answer the second part of your question i'm not going to lie it has been hard at times to to delegate you know you always not always but sometimes think you know you can do the job best you kind of learn over time well one surround yourself with good people and give them the latitude to do the job that you've employed them to do. Otherwise, you know, you're not going to retain those people either. And and often, you know, certainly I have found a lot of those people do the job a hell of a lot better than, you know, I ever did. Absolutely. It's always a good idea to surround yourself with people with MBAs. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, David, you, you touched on the fact before, which I think probably slightly too modestly, uh, that you don't that you don't have an entrepreneurial approach to, to business. If I think about some of the things that you've sort of pioneered within the industry, I'd probably just disagree with that fairly strongly. But, you know, alternate assets, as an example, you were onto alternate assets as an asset class and investment vehicle well before the broader market. Do you want to just talk about how, how you sort of look at the world, how you come up with some of these new investment thematics, because that's then moved on to things like managed accounts um, and, you know, I think probably more broadly ESG? It has, Matt. I, I guess, uh, again, this is born out of being close to the end investor, which I think, again, if I've got a criticism of, you know, some parts of the industry, we can get too removed from the end investor. So while our client is the financial advisor, you know, ultimately they're servicing or we're all there to service the end investor. So, you know, I think um, it's pretty instructive to understand what they're looking for. You know, we, we know that people don't want to lose money. We know that people want to generate a, uh, a reasonable return. We, we know that people want to sleep at night. So. In terms of introduction of alternatives, as you said, and I'm not going to say that we got all of those right either, you know, we researched and recommended hedge fund of funds, which, you know, if you remember at the time, were promised equity-like t- returns with bond-like volatility and ended up with sort of uh, bond-like returns with cash-like the volatility. Reverse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, But I do think, you know, we're pretty open-minded and like to sort of pride ourselves on identifying things fairly early that can bring something to the portfolio. And when I say bring something, it's, you know, either sort of capital protection or enhanced returns through different market cycles. I say to a lot of the kind of younger analysts in our business, and as you mentioned before, I think, to be honest, if I was looking for a job in the industry these days, I'd struggle again because just, you know, the, the, the level of academic qualifications that people come in with these days is outstanding. And you've got a lot of smart people that are in a hurry to progress their career, but you know, as an analyst and as an investment professional, the one thing you can't unfortunately rush is experience and seeing a lot of different market conditions. And as a fund analyst, reviewing reviewing managers in very different market conditions and, and in, in particular in times of stress. So periods like we've got kind of at the moment or even prior to that, you know, reviewing value managers in the decade long bull market for growth. You know, they're, they're the sort of things that, you know, you really do learn the most. From a research perspective. Before we bring you the second part of this chat, a little bit about who we are. Celebrating over 20 years, NetWealth is an ASX listed company that has been rated number one for overall user satisfaction by investment trends for eight consecutive years in their Planner Technology Report. As the financial advice landscape changes, it's important to embrace new technology to enhance the way you run your business. With change comes your chance to innovate, explore new perspectives and realise new efficiencies. NetWealth is here to support you on this journey by providing you market-leading technology, excellent customer support and expertise to help your business thrive. Contact us today or visit the NetWealth website to learn more and get the PDS which should be read before making a decision to purchase a net wealth product. Products issued by Net Wealth Investments Limited. So much of what you do, particularly now that you've moved into sort of the managed account space, uh, model management, portfolio construction is around education. Is that a part of the job that you enjoy? It is. Uh, you know, I actually, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, actually, Matt, I enjoy actually presenting to advisors' clients. As I said, you know, you, you've got to communicate that and what you do in a way that the lay person can understand. And again, I think that's really instructive in terms of, you know, how you write research reports, how you write portfolio reports and portfolio updates and so forth. 
But it's more than that, as you said, you know, like introducing new alternatives and so forth. You've got to, with the greatest of respect, educate the advisor as to what the strategy is, what it's going to bring to the portfolio, what they can expect from it, and in what types of market conditions will it, you know, do really well, in what types of market conditions will it struggle. So I, th- I find, you know, the educational aspect, as you said, is a lot about managing people's expectations. And so then if something does happen, you sort of say, well, remember, this is the type of market which we sort of said that, that that'll struggle in, but it's generated fantastic returns also. So, yeah, the education aspect is, is something I very much enjoy. One of the big trends that we've seen over the last five or six years, and this has really cumulated through through managed accounts, is this trend to outsourcing the investment piece and for financial advisors and their businesses to really focus on the strategic and, and client management side. Interested to get your observations on on that, but also how advisors or how you're finding the industry is interacting with their researchers. Are they still wanting to be involved? Are they riding shotgun, so to speak? Or are they really saying, look, David, you and your team specialise in investments. Uh, I'm going to leave it to, to you entirely. Again, you would see this, Matt, and being you know a, a large provider of managed accounts, it's a it's a bit of both, to be honest. I, I do think the first mover kind of into managed accounts w- tended to be those that want to be more involved. As you know, our business, and we've got sort of you know a bit over four billion in funds under management or advice, however you want to talk about it from a managed account perspective. That And, and a large proportion of that is customised. So having dealt with either existing clients or new clients that kind of had models and moving into a managed account construct has been quite revolutionary for their businesses. And so they do want some involvement. Again, as you know, ultimately as the model manager and our, our uh, we need to report to you as RE and platform governance. So we, you know, we're ultimately on the hook for the decisions. But yeah, certainly those customised clients and advisors like to have some involvement. I, I do think that's getting harder and harder for the reasons, like we mentioned before, there's just so much product. There's quite sophisticated product. So to be able to, you know, grow an advice business service, your clients do all the other things, as you said, you know, cash flow, estate planning, insurance, all that sort of thing, as well as be across all of the individual investments in the market is, well, it's, it's impossible. So that's why people hire us. It's What's subsequently happened, as, as you know, is that um, I think now that we're, what, half a dozen years down the track with the managed account structure, advisors of... Um, well, to go back to your point on education, uh, they understand them. There's comfort. And I think, you know, it's the same with the new product or asset class as well. It requires, in my observation at least, a number of players to be there a number of years to give the whole kind of sector some legitimacy. And we, we you know, we're well and truly past that now. So what we are finding, you are as well, is a lot more support for managed accounts that are um, available on platforms. Um, you know, either the advice group is not big enough to have customised or they don't want customised. They want that arm's length. So uh, that's that's certainly happening. One of the interesting observations is that when advisors probably come to you, their reasons for wanting to use managed accounts or thinking they might need a managed account are actually very different to the benefits that an advisor is, that's been using one for a number of years will typically cite. Again, just interested in your your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the things that perhaps didn't mention, but, but now being part of the broader FE Fund Info group, they have a very similar kind of managed account or, you know, model portfolio construct in the UK. And as you said before, the experience in the UK is that um, the majority of advisors now outsource you know, their portfolio construction, management, monitoring, reporting, for all the reasons we talked about before. Um, you know, I, I think um, f- for the most part, like I said, w- we often find that those advice practices that are most attracted to uh, kind of managed accounts are those that have been running sort of models before. And usually you'll have either a person, you know, kind of, responsible for that, but also half doing financial planning. It just becomes too much. So I think one of the things that perhaps they learn 
when they do have managed accounts, as opposed to models, is that certainly over a medium and longer term period, clients in the same or yet yeah, all in the same models have a much more consistent experience. Mm. Whereas, you know, having to execute changes as and when clients come in for reviews and so forth, even if it's a kind of model portfolio, it's, they're going to have very, very different experiences, um, even over medium and sort of longer term periods. So that's, I think that's a real eye opener for a lot of advisors. And um, it's, it's certainly a lot more defendable from a compliance perspective. And have you seen a big increase in demand post the volatility that we've experienced over the last couple of years? Yes, we have. I, I, and again, I think that's, um, you know, the, as you say, the period that we're going through at the moment where, you know, people need to be, to use the word kind of agile again, in being able to adjust portfolios. Even if it's just, I mean, I, and I shouldn't say just because it's a very important and powerful way of investing, even if it's rebalancing portfolios, you know, like the ability to do that in a managed account construct is like, you know, light years ahead of, again, doing it on a paper-based model portfolio basis or worse still, individual customised portfolios for individual clients. And I, I think with the exception of, you know, very high net worth practices with small numbers of clients, that, that really isn't a re- realistic business model in, in my view. Any advice for people or advice firms considering or looking at managed accounts? It's, they need to be committed. Like they need to be committed to the onboarding process. I know that your due diligence and that of the other major platforms is, um, is heavy and it should be. You know, you, you, you want to be, as do we, want to be partnering with with serious uh, advice businesses if they're going down that customised route. So there's a lot in it, you know. As I said, there's the, there's the portfolio construction, there's the PDS, there's investment policy statements. They need to be aware of how trading and execution is going to work. There's a lot more in that than most advisors understand as well. So, you know, don't even contemplate it unless you're willing to spend the time on the onboarding and due diligence process. And that, you know... I mean, ultimately, that you're uh, you're going to use the managed accounts. So I think you know, as a as a our business and sales team, we've got much better at understanding those businesses and practices that you know are saying look, we want to have managed accounts, and assessing those that you know will adopt them and uh, and move the money quickly. Excellent. Now, with everything going on in the market at the moment and the industry, what are some of the other things that you're thinking about and trying to solve? Well, you mentioned before, you know, the whole sort of ESG responsible investment. Yeah, let's face it, it's more than a theme. It's here to stay. It is interesting, you know, like that, that's, uh, that'll be tested a little bit right at the moment for, for a couple of reasons. It's, I think, kind of easy in a way when returns are really strong for investors to say, you know, I want my... I want my investments to be doing good things. When you're trying to protect capital and generate returns in a really, you know, tough market, uh, does that sort of dilute or test people's commitment to ESG? Um, and I think at the margin, that's that's probably right. The other thing, of course, that we've had at the moment is that uh, ESG or responsible investment portfolios have generally underperformed, as opposed to sort of. You know, again, I shouldn't use mainstream, but I guess maybe uh, traditional portfolios is a because you know they've been underweight energy, they've been underweight alternatives, and you know they've been two of the either sectors or subsectors or asset classes that have actually done really well. So there's been quite a big or material difference in um, the returns of traditional and ESG portfolios. You know, I had a client talk to us a while ago about um, setting up some additional portfolios ESG. I said to him, so what do you, yeah, we, by all means, we can do that. What do you want to call them? You know, is it ABC ESG or ABC Responsible Investment Portfolios? And he actually said, no, neither. And I think this is a challenge that the whole industry is facing. And I said, well, why is that? And he said, well, I don't want to give the perception that what I've been doing over here is black. You know, now we've got the nice, shiny, polished white in terms of the ESG. So, you know, there's clearly, ESG practices will merge and are merging into mainstream. Will it always be the case that dedicated ESG funds and portfolios will evolve to a higher level? I'm not sure. 
But yeah, that's that's a kind of challenge I think facing the whole industry at the moment. So yeah, a couple of challenges. Uh, but it, you know, as I say, clearly it's here to stay. And you know, the focus on in particular, well, the two things we see being focused on at the moment is is the climate change aspect and you know carbon offsets and credits and so forth, and actually gender, gender diversity. So they're the two big ones that seem to occupy more people's concern right at the moment. I, I think that's a really interesting point on the ASG and the, and the reasons for underperformance. Sort of think, thinking that through, does that mean that when advisors and researchers and portfolio constructors are putting these portfolios together, that the timeframes actually need to be much longer, that a balanced portfolio or balanced ESG portfolio is not zero to five years recommended. It's actually zero to 10 because of the nature of the transition of many of these asset classes. Yeah, exactly. Oh, well, transition's a great description there because as you say, you know, there's uh, there's a lot of support for um, alternative sources of energy, clean energy and so forth. And, you know, you could argue that's been you know, accelerated by what's happened, um, unfortunately, with the Russia-Ukraine crisis and what that's meant for energy prices and disruption and so forth. So I do think, you know, that's potentially accelerated. And, And there will be swings and roundabouts, you know, like... And let's hope there is a speedy resolution to the Russian Ukraine crisis. And, you know, I think as a number of the managers have said to us, look, and even value managers are not who are traditionally quite heavily invested in energy. Uh, A number of them are not because um, if, if there is a resolution to the crisis, the bubble comes out of that probably pretty quickly. So there will be swings and roundabouts in terms of, you know, but I think you're right in that, you know, some of the transition to you know, some of the ESG and RI best practice is not an overnight thing. It's going to take time. So certainly patience and long-term kind of investment horizons definitely required. One of the other challenges that we're struggling with a bit as a business and, and therefore I think probably the industry, you know, we're, I think everyone's aware of greenwashing and, and mislabeling and, and, and that's well understood. The data sources, though, that sit below a lot of this screening and um, sort of ESG categorisation seems to be very immature. And there's countless of examples of that, including one that we looked at recently where we, we looked at one of the research firms, Net Wealth um, Research Report, and we'd been downgraded quite heavily on governance in this particular instance. The reason for that was that we operated in financial services and therefore there was a high risk of reputational damage. Now, we tried to engage with that particular provider, got nowhere, it was computer says no style scenario. How can the industry actually evolve or, or ensure that the ESG data is actually where it needs to be and it's reflective of what's really going on in portfolios? Well, again, I think that's a good observation because uh, there's still, uh, there's a lot of subjectivity, you know, that goes into ESG data and criteria. So, you know, some things are measurable. Carbon and carbon offsets is measurable. Yes, it's still evolving quickly and, you know, it's really uh, probably the domain of the larger businesses and companies that are able to do that or or have consultants or providers that are able to do that. But that that'll... You know that'll certainly um, uh, will will be able to kept, be calculated. Some of the other stuff is pretty subjective. So uh, you know, as you said, this whole this whole asset classes like let's face it, like you know, government bonds is a massive asset class, which really is uh, one of the laggards in terms of of having ESG data and classifications and characteristics to it. And yet, equities is the other was probably the most evolved. But the, the different providers assess the same company quite differently. So, you know, a lot of those measures are kind of pretty subjective or relatively subjective and or the different providers have different weights on different criteria. So you get, you get very different outcomes even on the same business from an ESG perspective. So will that become more standardised? You know, I think, I think it will. But there'll always be areas, as far as we can sort of see, of, you know, subjectivity that'll lead to differences in kind of measurements and categorizations of businesses and companies and ultimately, you know, funds and portfolios. Does that lead to a situation where advisors should be seeking almost consensus? Great question. I, you know, look, it's, it's a really difficult challenge so this isn't really answering your question, but, um, you know, like in any kind of pooled vehicle, whether it be, you know, a managed fund or even, you know, you know some of the industry super funds that, um, you know, are doing quite a lot, the ESG side of things, 
you know, individuals have have uh, different values. You know, you could be a uh, a fund or a super fund that, you know, ticks eight out of ten of those values from an individual investor perspective, but the other two they're vehemently against. So it's it, it, you know it, it's a difficult one to solve for. So yeah, I mean, I think you know we've as you know we've built dedicated. ESG portfolios from a number of our clients. And, um, you know, for the most part, that's satisfying uh, that client cohort that's interested um, in investing that way. But that's going to need to evolve because the education and understanding by the end investor of the ESG criteria is going to, um, going to develop pretty quickly as well. All right, we could probably spend another hour going down this rabbit hole. Uh, another easy question for you, David. Uh, retirement income. What are you doing in that space? We're honestly tinkering around the edges, to be honest, Matt. And I think for the most part, that's symptomatic of the whole industry. And again, that's, you know, I don't want to assign blame, but, you know, we do need greater clarity from the government, from Treasury, and real clarity around retirement incomes policy. And I think once you get that, you start to get some product innovation uh, from managers, you get some portfolio innovation. You know, I, I do I do think as an industry, we started to make some inroads on that, as I say, maybe uh, six, seven years ago. And then guess what else happened? Managed accounts arrived. And so that kind of took over. And that's been a, a great evolution to the extent that, you know, for a number, a couple of clients, I won't say a, a wide number yet, they have established their managed account portfolios. And as you know, at times of thinking, okay, we've got this kind of better down and nutted. We need, we need some dedicated options for our retirement or drawdown clients. Um, and so, you know, that certainly has, a, has started to establish but it's been a bit more evolutionary than revolutionary at the, at the moment. And I think, you know, we need that, we need that real clarity. We've got the, re, the, the retirement incomes covenant now, which helps, but I think uh, we, we need more. David, unfortunately, we've run out of time. We've covered, as always, a lot of topics in, uh, in a short period of time. Um, you've been really generous with your answers. Uh, thanks so much for coming in and great to catch up as always. Thanks, Matt. Been a, a great chat. I, I need to interview you to get uh, a lot of those answers from you. No chance. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thanks again. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this episode of Between Meetings. For more episodes and to subscribe to our series, visit the NetWealth website, iTunes, Spotify, or your favourite listening service. And if you want to contact me or engage or discuss any of the topics raised, please find me on LinkedIn or Twitter or send me a private message. We hope you can tune into the next episode. 